Can I refill your eggnog for you? Get you something to eat? Drive you out to the middle of nowhere? Leave you for dead? No, I'm doing just fine, Clark. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today you'll learn how to be a better leader in your family or your team with the president of Think to Perform, Chuck Wachendorfer. In our headlines, an investing legend has passed away. We'll pay our respects. And for our TikTok Minute, what's more painful than childbirth? What if you're delivering a charcuterie board? Plus, we'll throw out the lifeline to lucky stacker Allie, who wants to know how to take her retirement distribution. And then, on top of all of that, I'll share some heavy trivia. And now... Two guys who are always rambling on with the best personal finance advice. It's Joe and oh, J-J-J-J-G. Can't stop this wagon train, Doug. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Stacky Benjamin Show. I'm Joe Salcihi, Average Joe Money on Twitter, on X, on uh, Threads. On uh, what else we got, OG? On Facebook. Insta. In- the Insta. Snap. <laughs> Did you do Snapchat? Do you do Snapchat? I'm not on Snap. <laughs> no, I'm not. OG barely does like smartphone. <laughs> to any of let that alone stuff. social media. <laughs> I am now on month 13 of not opening. In fact, it's not laughable when people send me stuff from Instagram. Doug sends me videos from Instagram that are his screenshot of him videoing the video from Instagram so he knows I get it. Because right. if he sends yeah. me a link to Instagram, I don't click on it. There's a couple of people. That, I only have two people in my life that do not do social media. And it's such a pain in the ass because then I have to record. I have to play the video and do the record thing on the iPhone and then send the people the video. I just, I just let him not be in on the joke, Doug. That's what I do. I'm like, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for your nonsense. Get with 1997, man. No, actually, how great would it be to just go back to flip phone? Wouldn't that be awesome? That's what I'm telling you. Like to, mine. To have mine. to press the button three times to get to the letter C. Yeah. I mean, that Texting would go down a lot, wouldn't it? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah a lot the less messages text. from Doug. That'd be nice. I Here's mean, what I've messaged, Doug. Let me tell you guys, Doug, this is exact. If we had a flip phone, this is the exact message I would send you. That sounds like Morris code. Do it again. Let me see if I can figure out what it said. Oh, ch- check it out. Hold on. Did you just say Morris code? Like Morris the cat? Yes, Morris. It's two S's at the end. <laughs> Who are you to be complaining, Doug? You said charcuterie. It's cooterie. Charcuterie. It's a cooter. It's right there. We, it's, we, that's how it's spelled. <laughs> Look, I'm the pro here at reading. We got a uh, guy who knows a lot about leadership. We know personally that he knows about a lot about leadership. We are both OG people who have worked extensively with uh, this gentleman and saw his incredible leadership. Do you remember if his you wonder, blue tuxedo at the Christmas party? I do. <laughs> uh, we're talking, of course, about leadership expert Chuck Wachendorfer yeah. is going to be joining us. And I got to say, if you're wondering what leadership has to do with money, well, we're going to kind of cover that in the headline because if if you're somebody who wants to earn a lot of money, I think you really need to up your your leadership game. If you're somebody leading the house at home, the charge at home, I think there's a lot to do there because as we've talked about before, Stack and Benjamin's a lot more than just about investing. It's definitely a lot about leadership. So all that, but first, man, a headline we never wanted to bring you, but we all know someday this is going to happen. So let's do it. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. This headline comes to you from, I think, every major publication on earth. We'll take ours from uh, uh, CNN because I actually like this story. Charlie Munger's best quotes on investing life and everything in between. If you have been in a cave somewhere or you're OG and doesn't uh, look at social media ever. I read the Wall Street Journal every three weeks just to catch up. Billionaire investor Charlie Munger, vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, longtime friend of Warren Buffett, died last Tuesday. He was 99 years, almost made it to 100, OG. Almost. Almost. He's actually has a uh, new book that's coming out, uh, I believe, the last week of this year. Posthumously. Yeah, and I know Charlie was very excited about about that book. But, oh, gee, this is a big name to lose. You know, I read it, obviously, in a couple of different places, and we're reading a lot of articles about it uh, or about, you know, his passing. 
And one of the things that kept coming up was he was the balance to Warren Buffett's like outgoing personality. He got a lot of the credit behind the scenes. And I think, I think Warren Buffett tried to give him lots of credit in public, but of course he wasn't the gregarious personality who ate McDonald's and drank cherry Coke every day and wanted to be on CNBC and, and host all the stuff. So he wasn't necessarily the guy, but uh, I was reading a story about when they first met and, you know, some of their uh, background and how they had done some investing similarly. And actually Charlie's investing partnerships had done better than Warren's investing partnerships over the period of time where they were kind of competitors. I don't know if that's a way to put it, but you know, when they weren't working together and Warren Buffett credits him with kind of changing his philosophy on all of overall his investing strategy, which was buy anything as long as the price is good to buy great companies at a fair price, as opposed to any company at a great price. And that kind of seems like it changed the trajectory of Berkshire Hathaway as as an organization, because prior to them working together, Warren Buffett was like, I'll buy anything if it's cheap. So basically, Warren was like a day trader before Charlie showed up. <laughs> he was he was his Wall Street bets version of Reddit, I guess. I don't know. But um, <laughs> he was the uh, only person maybe on Earth who could look Warren Buffett in the eye and say, Warren, you're not thinking about this correctly. Yeah. Like, no. I don't there is nobody else on Earth, I think, that could look at Warren Buffett. Well, a lot of people could say it. But he's the one I person. <laughs> yeah. He's the one person that Warren would actually listen to if he said it. Yeah, there are some cool stories in there. I've got uh, uh, Warren Buffett's biography. It's like seven thousand pages, and I have read zero pages of it. But I bet you there's a lot of good stuff in there about that. It might might crack that this holiday season just for. Well, it's a definitely a great time to do that because. Charlie Munger's forgot more about investing than many people even know. Uh, Charlie, in the last few years, of course, we just, I think we're coming down off the big crypto boom now. I really feel like that's settling in. I don't know what to what to say about the crypto boom, but when they asked uh, Charlie his opinion of crypto on CNBC, he got some pushback. And then over and over, he would come back with quotes like this. This is uh, Charlie Munger on CNBC. I don't think there are good arguments against my position. I think the people that oppose my position are idiots. And, and, and so I don't think there is a rational argument against my position. This is an incredible thing. Naturally, people like to run gambling casinos where other people lose. And the people who invented this crypto crapo, which is my name for it, sometimes I call it crypto crapo and sometimes I call it well, crypto. Whoa. <laughs> it's just ridiculous that anybody would buy this stuff. <laughs> crypto crap. To be fair, it is up 130% over the last year. But, <laughs> yeah. but uh, you know, you had to take it on the chin to get the, the plus 130, you know, in the last 12 months. But that's right. I know crypto there was crap-o. some. I'm, I'm going I'm I'm to I'm hang on to that one. I like the long pause. Doug, we asked our stackers in mom's basement which is our Facebook yeah. group about this. And I know they had some stuff to say. Yeah, we got a number of responses there. Uh, Tom Arneberg said in my whole, his favorite quote was, in my whole life, I have known no wiser people over broad subject matter area who didn't read all the time. None, zero. You'd be amazed at how much Warren reads and at how much I read. My children laugh at me. They think, they think I'm a book with a couple of legs sticking out. <laughs> but uh, so it sounds like Tom really took Charlie's advice literally and he reads all of the time. I think it's so important. I, I think it is so, so important. I know both of you guys read all the time. Yep. Yep. Do. Definitely do. I don't think OG can get anywhere without working on sharpening the saw. You got to keep sharpening that saw. Yeah, I've gone through the whole Richie Rich catalog, and I'm circling back around and starting over again. And I'm also layering in some Archie and the gang <laughs> as well. So it's really, you can get so much from those. Uh, Dan Anderson posted, this one is paraphrased, but was similar to, he would rather hire a person with 150 IQ who thinks it's really 130 than a person with 150 IQ who thinks it's really 170. <laughs> That's absolutely fabulous. I love- a little humility. Oh, absolutely. Well, and I love this. We talked about last week, guys, about- you know, this rat race where we think that if we just have a little more money, like if we just make a little more, if we just have a little more, if we just get a little more, that we're going to be better off. This was Charlie's take on all that, which 
this is a riff on my favorite quote from Charlie, which he talked about this topic quite a bit. The world is not driven by greed. It's driven by envy. So the fact that everybody's five times better off than they used to be, they take it for granted. All they think about is somebody else has having more now, and it's not fair that he should have it, and they don't. That's the reason that God came down and told Moses that you couldn't envy your neighbor's wife or even his donkey. And so it's built into the nature of things. It's weird for somebody my age because I was in the middle of the Great Depression when the hardship was unbelievable. I was safer walking around Omaha in the evening than I am in my own neighborhood in Los Angeles after all this great wealth and so forth. You know, one thing I hate about trying to get audio off a of TikTok video is it comes with its music soundtrack as well. But uh, I think Munger there, OG, pointing out something, it doesn't matter how much you have if your neighbor has more and you're always looking at what your neighbor's got. You're always like, ooh, look at that shiny thing. Yeah. Well, and that's really the biggest the biggest risk with everything is the comparison tool. <laughs> you know, because there's always I mean, literally, unless you're Warren Buffett or Charlie Bugger or Elon Musk or Bezos, right? Like there's always somebody that has well, more. But, and the way OG fights that, Joe, is he's just the neighbor that has all of the stuff. <laughs> and then he doesn't <laughs> he doesn't have to worry you know, about it's just, it the being struggle other is real. I, the struggle is real. I though. know the great way to not be envious of anybody else <laughs> if I already own it. You know what's funny though is that I even noticed this in an article a couple of weeks ago, or maybe over the Thanksgiving break, where people were poo-pooing Bill Gates because he had sold some of his Microsoft stock. You know, obviously he sold some over the years, right? He's, you know, diversified his investments and whatnot. And people are like, oh, what a loser. If he'd just hold on to it, he'd be with a trillion dollars right now. It's like even Bill Gates, who at one point in time, I imagine was the richest guy in the world and now is in the top whatever, 20 probably, or some significantly high number. <laughs> There's still articles going, yeah, he sucks. He sucks, man. It's like, he could, what? He could have been number 18 if he just stayed focused. What a loser. He had sold some of his stuff and bought a house. What a dork. I think still, though, OG, the point that you can, you know, stack Benjamins or stack stuff just because your neighbor owns it is a nice lesson. Yep. Yeah. I don't know how. How do you transition to the TikTok minute off of Charlie Munger passing away? I have, well, do you have a favorite quote? Joe, did you already? Well, my favorite is on that topic of envy. I wanted to play that because that is definitely my favorite. He said it very succinctly. I put it in the Facebook group in the basement, the exact quote that I have. But it was really, Doug, I mean, you've got it, I think, right in front of you. It's pretty much a riff on what we talked about. Yeah, right. You know, my favorite, I, it's, it, maybe you could say it, it is in that same category of, you know, how do you handle uh, or prevent yourself from getting envious. And my favorite is when he said, uh, you know, it's okay, Grandpa. I bet those golden tickets make the chocolate taste terrible. <laughs> that was that was my favorite one. Oh, that's good. That is, there's so many great uh, mongerisms. You can join our Facebook group if you're in there. Uh, please add yours. I think it's a nice uh, fitting tribute that we've got going on there. And um, man, we're going to miss Charlie Munger. I feel like guys that, that type of um, that type of common sense thinking that Charlie had, oh gee, I think we need a lot more of that. I agree. So back to how the hell do I transition to the TikTok? It's super easy. <laughs> just don't do transitional material. Oh. Doug knows that I don't do it. You just go. And now, and now it's time for our TikTok minute. The time when we take a look at some incredible or maybe air quotes, incredible creator on TikTok. And we asked the question, is this brilliant or is it air quotes brilliant? Doug, we'll ask you today. You think we're going to get some brilliance or some air quotes brilliance? No, brilliant. This oh. is, yeah. Well, this 170 is, level IQ. Every once in a while, we find one that's very much like a TikTok, but someplace else. Uh, Tina on our team, who does an amazing job curating our videos for YouTube and for social media. Tina found this uh, as a Facebook reel. Find everything you need today? Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. Oh, God. No. Everything okay, ma'am? Uh, it's just that you've only scanned a few items and it's already 60 bucks. Uh, I'm so scared. Okay, I'm a trained professional, ma'am. I've scanned a lot of groceries. I need you to stay with me. It's just that my in-laws are in town and they want a charcuterie board. Well, this isn't going to be easy, so I need you to be brave, all right? What's your name? Patricia. Patricia, all right. I need you to take a deep breath. We're about to do the cheese. <gasps> oh, my God. The numbers are going up so fast. 
Why do we have to be a Balderson's house? Don't look up there. It only makes it worse. Keep your eyes on me, okay? <sighs> Can't you just scan something less expensive? I can, but let's not forget. It's the little things that add up, all right? Now brace yourself. I'm about to do the mixed nuts. Oh, my God. I'm going to pass out. Okay, bite down on this, Patricia. <sighs> Get ready. I'm going to do the cured meats. <sighs> It's too late. There's a line behind you, okay? You're locked in. I'm not strong enough. I know it looks like a lot right now, but I promise you, you're going to get home and you're going to wonder, what did I even buy? <laughs> <laughs> You've got this, Patricia. Get ready. I'm going to weigh the grapes. Oh, oh, what have you done to me, you son okay, of a... Okay, your total's 257.84. Oh, no. you got to dig deep. This is the hardest part. Patricia, it's time to pay. <laughs> The pain is real. It's like when you go to Costco. Like I bought what? I wasn't trying to buy for the people behind me. I just wanted to buy my own groceries. That's that bit from uh, the progressive commercial where he's at the <laughs> salad bar. The guy goes, that'll be 1961. He goes, oh no, I'm just paying for mine. <laughs> right. Yeah, I love that. I'm 100% going to use that next time I'm out. <laughs> that, that really resonates with me. We went to Costco and my middle kid nailed the Costco price to the dollar. Wow. Like in terms of like, this is how much this is going to be. I don't know if he was doing it in his head or maybe on his phone as he was as we were going through and nobody was paying attention, but he got it on the button. And it was always like when you go to Costco, it's like, oh, I'm just going to go in and get some. Uh, I just need toilet paper and some peanut M&Ms. And it's like, so I bought some of that homemade mac and cheese, uh, <laughs> six cases of Perrier, um, 14 dozen eggs, a pecan pie. They looked amazing. Mm. And uh, some fillets and a brisket. And that's it. And six pounds of turkey. And a whole bunch of those little frozen cupcake things that you can microwave. Thanks to Tina on our pounds team of coffee. <laughs> for, for sending that our way. Thanks also, by the way, to, uh, I mentioned that Tina does YouTube videos. Also, Dan, Dan and Tina together do our YouTube videos. Go check out uh, this video and more over on our YouTube page. Also, if you want to dive deeper into some of the mongerisms out there and leadership, the topic we're about to talk about, subscribe to our 201 newsletter stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. It's always free. Always comes out the day after our Monday, Wednesday shows, which would be Tuesday, Thursday, if my math is correct. If that still holds, uh, if math still makes sense, that's the deal. Stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Coming up is a leader who, OG, you and I know very, very well. He actually led us when we were both with American Express in Detroit. He has consulted with some of the biggest companies, with uh, government agencies, some of the best and brightest have learned from our next guest, Chuck Wackendorfer, is joining us. And uh, on top of all that, OG, he's got a name that's fun to say, Wackendorfer. That is kind of cool. It sounds yeah. like you're still angling to get a raise from this guy. You've just pumped him up so much. <laughs> you... <laughs> well, if he's... You want a promotion, too? If he's on the show, I mean, on Mondays and Wednesdays, we want to bring it. And I got to tell you something that I dislike, Doug. I dislike when people like, oh, I'd like to introduce you to my next guest my neighbor. And I'm like, I don't care what your neighbor thinks about this. Like we got to curate top people for our stackers. And uh, man, it was a privilege to work with this guy. And I'm super happy that we have him on. So yeah, yeah. I want to tell you why. It's not just that we got to work with him and see it firsthand. I think hopefully he's going to mentor people pretty damn well. Okay. So back off, pal. Back off. Okay, fine. I'm not giving you a raise. <laughs> How about some trivia, Doug? Okay, fine. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. You know, I haven't been to Las Vegas since I saw Britney Spears perform there during her residency at Planet Hollywood. Now that my broken heart is finally mended after she ignored my homemade will you marry me sign, I think I'm finally ready to go back. You just want Britney to do it to you one more time? I, the first time would be great, actually. I don't need one more. I need the first time. Anyway, from Liberace to Barry Manilow to Adele, it seems like one of my favorite musicians is always performing in Vegas. Of course, I'm too young to have seen Liberace, but there's a rumor in my family that my grandma once hooked up with him. U2 is the latest band to sign up for a residency in Sin City, committing to dozens of shows through next February inside the Sphere. That might not sound like very many shows for such a legendary band, but they've been together with the original lineup since 1978. That's 45 years of working and traveling together, more than 20 times the length of my longest relationship. I bet The Edge never complained when Bono left his dirty socks in the living room, did he, OG? Or when he accidentally left the hose running overnight, did he, Ma? 
Yeah, he doesn't complain about that. That's how they stay. Anyway, which is exactly why they've lasted longer than any other rock band in history and why I'm packing my bag right after I record this question. Speaking of, today's trivia question is, on today's date in 1980, what band climbed the proverbial stairway to heaven? I'll be back right after I find my old band's cassette demo. Hey there, stackers. I'm former rocker and possible illegitimate grandson of Liberace, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. During the break, I found my old band's cassette demo and man, we were good. I think I'm gonna send it out to radio stations again. Today's trivia question is, on this date in 1980, what band climbed the proverbial stairway to heaven? The answer, formed in 1968 and considered one of the very first heavy metal bands, Led Zeppelin officially split on this day in 1980. And now, here to teach you how to be a more positive and impactful leader, it's Chuck Wachendorfer. Wachendorfer. It is fun. You're right, Joe. And I'm super happy we have him here on my dad's shortwave radio. I've interviewed a ton of people. There are very few of our guests I know as well as I know our current guest, Chuck Wachendorfer, joins us. How are you, man? It is so great to be here, Joe. It's been a long time. Our paths, as you mentioned, crossed many years ago, and uh, it's happy to be back together with you. I am super happy you're here. I love this project. I think that we, especially, you know, as we kick off, what do we have? Uh, uh, maybe 40 something weeks until this election, like leadership and, and uh, truthfulness and integrity, I think are on everybody's mind right now. Absolutely. You know, we started writing this book probably in 2018. And our, our basic premise, Joe, is everybody's a leader. And we say that because First of all, we're influenced by what we read, what we watch, who we, who we hang out with, and most of our behavior is observable by other people. So we're both influenced by who we hang out with and what we read, but we're also influencing. And leader, leadership at its fundamental level is about influence. And so in 2018, Doug and I, are, my co-author, Doug Lenick, and I were talking about what was going on in the world at the time. This is obviously before covid but we were lamenting like a lot of the bigger issues in life in the world, frankly, that, that a lot of people were waiting for somebody else to fix. You and I were at American Express, the same place where you begin this project. We were both in Detroit. I remember the day of the World Trade Center bombing, which is the first story that you tell. Mm -hmm. And I remember, Chuck, usually I was at work fairly early. I go to the office fairly early. But on this day, it was my job to drop off my kids at school. So it was maybe 9.15. I'm rolling mm -hmm. in the back stairs at my office in Troy, Michigan. And a guy who you know, another financial planner named Glenn Cooper, Glenn comes down the back stairs, Chuck, and he says, another plane hit the other building. And I said, another what? Like, wh like what, are you, what are you talking about? I had no idea any of that was happening. Do you remember where you were when the planes hit the World Trade Center? I was at an Einstein's walking in. I was getting ready to fly. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, every, I'm sure all your listeners have the same kind of, I know where I was when this happened. And so I was walking into Einstein's and it kind of had a similar thing. Guy walks past me out the thing and he goes, I can't believe a plane just hit the World Trade Center. I was like, what? And as we're walking in, they had a TV on and it was probably about 9.15. All of a sudden, I see a second plane fly into the second World Trade Center. I turned to my wife and I said, that's not an accident. Well, and I thought when Glenn said it to me, Chuck, I thought it was a Cessna. You know what I mean? I thought it was a, I had right. no idea the magnitude of, of what was going on. You and I then had a front row seat to seeing a leader who has been known, and I think rightfully so myself, a guy named Ken Chenault at American Express, try to navigate this company, which by the way, the American Express building right there in New York. Tell us the story of Ken Chenault dealing with an organization and stepping up in leadership during that time. Well, there was so many things you can imagine impacted American Express's business at the time. Not only did they lose employees, not only did they lose their world headquarters, but their entire business model was affected because travel was shut down. If you remember, the stock market was closed for five days after that. 
about the first three days after they opened the market, stocks fell like a rock. So he's losing value in the company. He's losing employees. He's losing his headquarters. His business is being affected because nobody's traveling. And here this guy has the wherewithal to bring people together in Madison Square Garden. And I forget, it was like 5,000, 6,000 people that were traumatized as we all were, but specific, specifically this group of people to talk about like what they can focus on, how they can begin to fix it, how they can see hope and optimism through this situation. I think it's a fantastic leadership story. Yeah, the fact that he, you know, with all this stuff going on in a deteriorating business at the time to lead with compassion, I felt like he put all that on the back burner and made it, what can I control and how much compassion can I have for these people? Absolutely. And we all get stuck. Things happen in life. You know, bad stuff happens to good people. And a leader's responsibility or part of a leader's responsibility is to help people get unstuck. So whether it's my family, my school, my company, my neighborhood, whatever, you know, part of what a leader does is to help people get unstuck is demonstrate empathy. And empathy, I think, is most underappreciated by leaders is Empathy is about recognizing how someone's feeling. It's not sympathy. Sympathy is I feel what you feel. Empathy is I recognize what you feel. And if I recognize you're emotional, you're upset, you're overwhelmed, you're frustrated, you're angry, then I can say, Joe, tell me more about that. We can talk about it. We can deal with it. And that's what Ken did. One of my favorite plot lines, by the way, from uh, just popular TV is when a leader totally misses out on empathy. Chuck, I was watching Mythic Quest last night, which is, it's a hilarious romp on Apple TV, but the leader is she's showing off her Porsche to this woman who makes far less money than she does. And you can see the total disconnect and, and the person actually getting angry that, <laughs> that the leader's mm. showing off, showing off this perk. You make the point very early, though. It doesn't have to be the leader of American Express. You don't have to lead the free world. You talk about uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, some of these big iconic people. But Chuck, you also talk about people who are much more people we've never heard of. And I'd love for you to tell a couple of these stories. I'd love for you to tell us about a guy named uh, Danny Bavaria, if you don't mind. Yeah, Danny Bavaria was a guy who fought in World War II came home and wanted to make a difference in his community in Pennsylvania and started a, a league for women's basketball, like junior high and high school. And he focused on not necessarily getting everybody prepared to play in college or the Olympics. I mean, unfortunately, I think a lot of uh, kids sports in the United States, everybody thinks their kids go to the Olympics. And not that he didn't want to help girls get better at basketball, but he was about helping them improve as people. And not necessarily if they played college basketball, that was great. But he, instead of taking people's money, as many kids sports do, you're going to be on a travel team, a club team, because we're going to get you to the next level. He was all about like making sure they were good people. They were great players. They were well-rounded. And he wanted to make an impact in his community. So we interviewed Olympic coaches, polar explorers, people like Danny, everyday normal people that focused on what they could do. Instead of waiting for somebody else to fix it, what can I do in my own life, in my own community to make that positive difference? And that's really what the world needs more of today. You know, a lot of times I feel like we think that we're not close enough to the event, right? You see these people that step up after an event. So you talked about Ken Chenault being right there in New York. So of course he's right there and his people are right there. So he has to. But you guys even talk about that at the beginning before we just, I want to get into the tactics in a second, but just, I think this is even a big point. A woman named Kristen Prodko, not involved at all with some of the shootings that have happened, but these deeply affected her. And she just decides she's out in the middle of somewhere else, Chuck, and just decides, you know what? It's my time. Talk about that. Yeah. It's what can I do to make a difference? And Kristen took a stance on, on gun control and impacting her community there to say, I can't maybe change laws. I can't necessarily influence Congress in my job, but what can I do? And I think that's the question we want people to be aware of is instead of waiting, what can I do in my little community, in my little, to make a positive difference? There's 7 billion people on the planet. If we had a third of them <laughs> thinking about what can I do every single day to make a positive difference? One of my favorite books out recently is a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. 
It's all about stopping bad habits and starting good ones. And one of the principles he leaves people with is getting 1% better. Could I get 1% better today than it was yesterday? Maybe I can't do 50 push-ups, but I could do one. Maybe I can't change gun control or I can't change the economy. I'm not the president of the United States, but could I demonstrate an act of kindness today to help somebody? And that's the ripple effect we're trying to talk about. And the eight essentials aim to be your ideal self, right? None of us is perfect, but aiming to be my ideal self. Most of us want to be our ideal self more often, but it begins with me knowing my values. Because if I live my values more often, I'm making that positive impact in my life and the lives of those around us. Knowing my real self, none of us is perfect. We're not, the point is not perfect perfection. It's about progress. So if I know who I hope to be ideally and I pay attention to who I am really, I can begin to close that gap. We're going to make mistakes, but could I make less mistakes? Could I correct those mistakes a little faster? Could I be a more positive influence? We think the answer to those questions is yes. Well, let's dive into a four-step process that you have because I think there's a lot of people listening. Chuck says, sounds great. I'm ready to go. Don't know where to start. You don't start where I thought you'd start. You start with self-awareness first, mm -hmm. being, being aware of yourself. Why do you start there? Well, because in order to be more effective with other people, this is the, what we call the leadership logic chain. There's four steps to it. The leadership logic chain is if I want to be more effective with other people, I got to do the best job of managing my own behavior. Managing my own behavior begins with me making better choices. Making better choices is grounded in self-awareness. So it's almost counterintuitive. That for me to build a great relationship with you, the person I have to pay the most attention to is me. And oh, by the way, this is also true about your money. I know we're talking about stacking Benjamins here today. 87% of portfolio growth, not portfolio performance, 87% of portfolio growth is saving and investing behavior. So what I decide to do with my money has the most impact on how much money I'm going to have. Not the market, not the economy. You know, it's, it's what I do with my money. How much I save and invest and how long I stay invested. So people worry about stuff that's going on in the market. But what they fail to pay attention to sometimes is how much money am I spending? How much money am I saving? How long am I investing? And so that's kind of the leadership logic chain applied to people's finances. If I pay attention to what I'm doing with my money, I'll probably make better choices with it. And we make 35,000 decisions a day. I don't know if that surprises anybody. Surprise hell out of Most me. Of them we don't think about. <laughs> like going to Starbucks and buying a $5 cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah. That's a decision I, may, I might make every single day, five days a week, every week of the year. That's a lot of money. And we all have things like that, but then I can start paying attention to it. So the model you're talking about, about in terms of decision-making are the four R's. So it's recognize, which is self-awareness. What am I thinking? What am I feeling? What am I doing? Right? Back to decision-making. This is, you know, I'm going to ask your audience, how many of you believe stupid is optional? Stupid is only optional if I notice and pay attention to myself. So if I notice I'm getting upset, I can then make stupid optional. That leads to the second R, which is reflecting. So I know I'm getting upset. That's recognize. What am I thinking? How am I feeling? What am I doing? That's the human experience of, of life. Thought is linear. Feelings are more than one. Actions are either voluntary or involuntary. So feelings aren't good or bad. Emotions aren't good or bad. It's what I do with the emotion that makes it good or bad. If I notice I'm getting emotional, emotions tend to sacrifice accuracy for speed. They want us to respond very quickly and are usually wrong. So the worst time to make any important decision, and I've at least listened to some of your previous episodes. I think there was a family that decided they were going to go to Hawaii and sunk themselves into a, a whole lot of debt. They went to Hawaii because they were emotional. It's exciting to go to Hawaii. Those high-energy emotions jeopardize our decision-making. So the second R is reflection. If I can... Reflect on what's important to me. I calm down. And when I calm down, I can think more clearly. It's why the people say sleep on it. When you sleep on a big decision, you engage the rational thinking part of your brain. 
So now when I'm calmer, I think about what's important, what I'm grateful for, who I love, I can think more rationally. And that leads to the third R, which is reframing. Well, and this is a great idea just to stop for just one second during the holiday season. I mean, yes. everybody, everybody's buying crazy crap for everybody else. And, and, and it's very natural then, Chuck, to go, hey, you know what? I'm buying all this stuff for everybody else. I see this thing's on sale. I'm just going to throw that into my cart, which is why I think it makes a ton of sense what you're saying. Leave it in your cart overnight. Look at it the next day and go, come on, I need my rational brain attached, not just the, oh my God, that thing's on sale and I can buy, buy myself some fun here this holiday season. This is an important tool to use right now, right? We, we had a discussion. I was with a bunch of friends over the weekend and somebody asked the question, what was your favorite gift as a kid growing up? And here's the interesting thing. There's probably five or six of us. Nobody could remember. So to put gift giving in perspective, I'm not saying don't give a gift. I'm saying don't risk your financial future for a gift that maybe 10 or 20 years ago, they might not remember. And so that leads to the third R, which is reframing. Now when I'm logical and calm, I can think about, well, I don't have to spend that much money to impress somebody on the gift I'm going to give them that I really can't afford. Maybe there are other options here. Maybe it's an act of kindness or an act of service. Maybe it's a less expensive gift to not jeopardize myself financially. That's reframing. We're exploring the options, evaluating the trade-offs, but you can only do that when you're in the right state of mind, when you're calm and less emotional. And I know Amazon and all kinds of stuff will send us alerts. There's things in your cart, Joe. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> you know, that stuff's getting way, you know, if you don't buy it now, it's not going to make it there by Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever. Well, Chuck, and part of that reframing for me was, and I think this is good advice for everybody. I turned off my alerts. Sometimes it drives my wife crazy because when I turn them all off, I turn them all off and then I have to check my phone. But man, when there were alerts on my phone, it was always somebody selling me something like consistently selling me. And I wouldn't even think I needed it, Chuck, until somebody said, Hey, guess what? Guess what? It's on sale today. Believe it or not. Yeah. It's not how much money you make, it's how you spend it. You know, when we were financial advisors, I remember I, I started my career in Dallas and we used to say the other the competition in Dallas were not the other financial advisors in town. It was the car dealerships, the shopping malls, the furniture galleries, all the stuff that we think we need, in air quotes, can't live without, and then you can't even remember it. You know, why did I buy that? It's about how much money you spend and how much you can save and invest. That's stuff that's in our control. I want to remind everybody before you give us the fourth R, Chuck, this is a conversation, guys, that we're having about leadership and the fact that leadership begins with you. And Chuck and I have spent so much time talking about it beginning with you. It's very difficult to lead others unless you begin to lead yourself. And I think for a lot of us, Chuck, is this big aha that maybe we maybe we need. Yeah, leadership begins at home. (laughs) That's what we like to say. And so if I don't lead myself well, and think about people in your own life, people have poor relationships, you know, don't do a good job with their money, don't have any money. It's usually because they manage, they don't manage themselves very well. And so we begin with self-leadership. If I do a good job of managing myself, then my influence with my money and with other people will grow. And that's what the eight essentials focus on, is what can I specifically do? We we wanted this book to be a workbook, a book that people can use. So there's tools in there. There's exercises. It's not theoretical. It's not, you know, big picture. We drill it down to behaviors. If I want my life to be different tomorrow, it begins with knowing what behaviors I have to change today. And that leads to the fourth R, which is responding. I don't have to make all 35,000 decisions a day better. But if I made one or two better choices, maybe it's the stuff I have in my Amazon cart. Maybe I don't go to Starbucks every day. You know, those kinds of things, those little tweaks can begin to change and impact my life. That's the ripple effect that James Clear talks about in Atomic Habits. It's getting 1% better. And so that's really the four R's. It's recognize, reflect, reframe, respond. They happen to be alphabetical. That's the way I remember them. 
<laughs> recognizes playing the freeze. What am I thinking, feeling, am I doing? If I notice I'm emotional, I got to play the second R, which is reflecting. Reflecting helps me calm down. When I'm calm, I can then explore my options. I don't have to buy all the stuff on my Amazon cart. Could I downsize some of it? Could I save some of it for a birthday later? That leads to a better decision in responding. You have a personal story about this, about you being exhausted every day that kind of is you working through this. And I think this is something a lot of us feel right now. We feel kind of exhausted. We feel a little overwhelmed. Tell us this story, Chuck, about you complaining about being being gassed every day. Yeah. You know, I was at the end of the day, one day, it was, uh, and I was sitting on the back deck with my wife and we were talking about our days and she was asking me about mine and I was telling her and I did the end of it. I just said, you know, I'm just worn out and exhausted. And she goes, you know, you say that a lot. And I said, no, I don't. And she goes, yeah, you do. <laughs> and convinced I was right. What do you think I started paying attention to? How often I said it? And what do you think I realized? You say it a she lot. She was right. right. Like people say, how you doing, Chuck? And I'll be like, I'm tired. I'm stressed. I'm worn out. Well, it wasn't even my own self-awareness. It was my wife's pointing out, heightening my self-awareness. I started paying attention to why was I worn out and exhausted? Well, I was doing stuff I didn't like with people I didn't respect. So then what do you think I started to do? Change that. But we tend to do what we've always done. Most of our lives, we live out of a part of our brain called the basal ganglia. That's the habit center part of our brain. And what happens is every pattern in, in, of behavior that we have is a pattern because at some point it worked for us. And what happens is as we get older and our lives change, some of those patterns hold us back. They stop working. So I worked with a very, very successful business owner years ago who made a lot of money, but miserable. I mean, literally the guy would work all day long, get home at eight o'clock, eat a quick dinner and work at his desk until he fell asleep. And who wake up at three o'clock in the morning in his home office on his desk. Is, it, is this Randy in the book? Uh, no, not Randy. This guy's name was Jeff. Okay, well, we'll get to Randy look. next because I wanted to actually use Randy to tie it together, but I love this. Keep going. I'm sorry. So anyways, I said, Jeff, where did you learn that you have to work like this? And Jeff, with any, in, without any hesitation, says, Jeff, Jeff says to me, I'm dyslexic. And so to get through college, I had to work two or three times as hard as everybody else to get through college. And that's what Jeff needed to get through school. But Jeff's 45 years old. He makes millions of dollars. He didn't need it, but he continued this pattern of behavior. And he was miserable. He was lonely. He had no relationships, no family, only work. But that was a pattern he started in his 20s. Randy was the same, same way, also a successful guy. But Randy says to me, you know, in five years, I got to stop doing this because I'm burnt. I'm burnt out. And I said, Randy, well, why don't we give some of your responsibility to the people on your team? And he goes, well, that's my job. I said, well, Randy, do some people, some of the people on your team want your job? He goes, yeah. I said, well, maybe giving them some of your job now would be opportunities for them to grow and develop. And he goes, I never thought about it that way. I said, so let's give these 15 balls you have in the air. Let's give half of them to some of the people on your team. Let them grow and develop. And Randy says, well, I don't know what I would do with my time. I said, well, what is it you've always wanted to do? He goes, I wanted to be a pilot. I said, well, what if you took pilot flying lessons? He goes, I love that idea. I said, okay. Literally, within a year, the guy bought himself his own airplane. Yeah. But it's like this. We tend to do what we've always done. And if you believe that when you're happier, you do better, paying attention to when you're happy is really important. I love those stories. I love the way that you practice self-care so that you can take care of other people. Randy did the same. You know, I was thinking as you were telling Randy's story, Chuck, was that, you know, we, we heard today people like uh, Ken Chenault. You also talk about in your book about how Randy is a very conscientious leader. People love working for him. He doesn't want to give stuff to people because he's so worried that he's pushing his task off on them that he does more himself, which makes him the type of person people want to work with. He's going to carry his load. But when you turn that around and you go, you're keeping them from their own development, something that truly is going to be legacy building maybe for, you know, for your company or let's even broaden this. If you're a parent, you're not letting your kids make some mistakes. You're not giving them the opportunity to grow. So whether it's a family, a company, your community, whatever it is, 
it's a hard thing to get, Chuck, that doing less is sometimes doing more. Yeah, you know, the question is, am I helping people or hurting people? Am I holding them back or am I helping them grow and develop? In order to grow and develop, we have to get uncomfortable. You know, most of us perceive comfort over discomfort. I get that. But when we pursue comfort all the time, we stop growing. And not only do we stop growing, so do the people around us. And so I have to be willing to get out of my comfort zone. In Randy's story, he was willing to get out of his comfort zone. He didn't know what to do with his free time. That was what was holding him back. He didn't want to impose it on other people. But when he, when he changed his perspective, when he changed what he thought about, back to reframing, when he saw that holding all these tasks not only made his own life miserable, but he denied growth opportunities for the people on his team. It was like a big shift. He's like, okay, I got it. And now the guy, because that was when Randy and I were talking, Randy was in his late 40s. You know, Randy's going to, he's got a much longer runway. Because he's enjoying his life. You know, being selfish isn't a bad thing. But to, to what you said earlier, if I don't take, do a good job of taking care of myself, I can't take care of other people. Not long term, I can't. The book is Don't Wait for Someone Else to Fix It, Eight Essentials to Enhance Your Leadership Impact at Work, Home, and Anywhere Else that Needs You. The uh, uh, What's funny is we, we only got to the beginning. We got to the, it begins at home, Chuck, to your point, but the book, it looks like available everywhere, right? Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Audible, Kindle, hard copy. I don't know if it's in paperback yet, but it's available wherever you might buy books, however form you'd like to buy it. It's a great gift for people as we're coming up on the holiday season. You might have people that would benefit from better self-leadership. And I said, it's not a business book. It's about, can I make a more positive impact in my own life, in the lives of the people that I care about? The answer is yes. Hey, this is Andy Hill from the Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast. And when I'm not singing Disney karaoke songs with my kids at home, I'm stacking Benjamins. So great to see Chuck again. It's like old times, like, uh, sir, yes, sir. So yes, <laughs> exactly. Yes. I'll get back on the phone. I'm sorry. Can we just do this interview? Would you like quick? me to take care of that for you, Chuck? It is great, but you know what was even better? And I'm so happy that we had Chuck on because I think our average stacker looking at the headline for today's show, going into the interview, was sure that Chuck was going to talk about, okay, you know, if you're leading the family, this is what you tell your kids. This is how you lay it out. This is the, these are the rules you create. This is the, and OG, we got none of that. We got none of that. I love that there's a deeper foundation than that. And I don't know, that really hit home for me. If you look at some of the old kind of classic leadership stuff, right? Like take Franklin Covey. The first part of Franklin Covey is all about building the foundation for yourself, right? Before you have the ability to build on other people. So, you know, you can't in the military and any organization, if the, if the captain's not willing to do the dishes, then how are you going to get the kitchen guys to do the dishes? You know, like you have to demonstrate it and have a good foundation of self leadership before you have the opportunity to have other people leadership. You know, I've talked in the past about how you hear one of our mentors say something that might be just their thing, their cool, neat spin on stuff, but you hear things over and over that there's a lot of truth there. And the story that he told about Randy and Randy wanting to make sure he picked up his load and always do his part so that his team saw him do his part and Chuck telling him, hey, Randy, if you're feeling burnout, you need to delegate stuff to these people. You're holding people back by doing more. That's the same type of training that we've been getting at Strategic Coach. Like there's the paradox of leadership is sometimes less is a hell of a lot more because you actually get out of the way and let people do their thing. So let people do their thing. Yeah, and grow. that's 100% right. Not only yeah. do what and they're good at, but also then grow and get better. So you don't have to do it anymore. But it's that ability to restrain yourself, to not say, I can do this better and faster, so I'm just going to do it. That's the challenge, I think, of being a great leader. Yeah, Doug's right. Doug's right. And what's interesting is that in your organization, whether it's you know your family, like you were talking about earlier, or you know your entrepreneur organization, whatever it is, the people around you want to do that stuff. They want they they want more responsibility. They want to have career growth and skill growth and all that sort of stuff too. And the only way that you're going to be able to grow is by getting rid of the stuff that 
is limiting you and giving them, you know, it's like this waterfall effect of in order to find the time to move to the next level for yourself or for your organization, you have to find ways to get rid of the stuff that you're already doing so you can do more things. There's just not more time in the day to be able to do it. Yeah. That's actually really, that's another great point is then that will give you time to get better. But more importantly, Steve, I think probably the most, the, the biggest thing that OG just said there, maybe in the history of the show, uh, was Doug's right. So can you just make a clip of that and can we have that available to play numerous times throughout future episodes? Just, yeah, Doug, he said it twice, actually. Yeah, Doug's right, Doug's right. So I we did. need to, yeah. we need to capitalize on that. Hey, let's throw out the lifeline and help a stacker get better with their money. If you've got a question for OG and I, this is a segment where we answer your question and hopefully help you stack more Benjamins. Send your question to stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail. And actually don't send it. Just go to that URL. <laughs> My first time using the computer thingy, stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail and uh, leave your question. And you know what? For being brave, we will also send you some sweet Stacking Benjamins greatest money show on earth swag. I know you're welcome. But we are super thankful for our stackers that have called in, especially for the one who called in today which is Allie. Hi, this is Allie, and I have more questions about annuities. I have a cash balance retirement plan that at retirement age, I can either take a full cash out of $1.1 million, or I can get $8,000 a month for the rest of my life. Given that my grandparents have all lived into their 90s and one lived to be 103. I think I have longevity in the family. I'm also in very good health and very good shape. So I think I will live for a long time. I also am not married. I'm divorced. I have one son. I also have plenty of money in a 403B. So I'm not worried about what I'm going to leave for him once I pass away. So it seems to make the most sense to take the annuity at $8,000 a month because if using the 4% rule, that 1.1 million, I'd only be getting about 40,000 a year. Whereas the annuity, I would be getting $96,000 a year. Am I missing something? Thanks so much. Allie, thank you so much to you. By the way, also thank you uh, to the dog who had to make the cameo at the end. I always like it when somebody does a cameo. You, you know, the people that, that photobomb, I love how your dog's like, wait, you're on the Stacky Benjamin show. I got to get in on that. I got like an exclamation point. <laughs> yeah. I liked it. And you know what he's telling all the other dogs next time he's barking? He's like, no, no, no. I was on Stacky Benjamin's. You should have heard it. It was amazing. She called. Yes. And I got my big moment. So congrats to your dog for now being famous. But uh, let's talk about this. 8,000 a month versus 1.1 million. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's a great problem to have, Allie. This is, this is my kind of problem. These are the types of decisions that I uh, love to have to make. I think there's some additional questions here that we have to answer before we can get to what is the right choice. And and really the first one is how far away are we from making this decision? Annuity companies, pension companies, whatever you want to call them, are notorious for printing out statements that go, hey, by the way, when you're 65, you're going to have this amount of money and you're going to get this amount of money and this is how much you're going to get forever and blah, 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 blah. When you're like 31. And so if you're a young person and you're seeing these pension calculations, I totally think it's fine to put it in your plan. And I totally think it's fine to put even some of it in your plan in terms of the different parameters, right? I, I don't know if I'm going to take the income or if I'm going to take the lump sum or whatever. But we have to recognize that the lump sum is going to be largely determined based on what interest rates are when you go to retire. So if you're going to retire tomorrow and these are the numbers that you've been given and hey, these are the facts of the case as of today, then we've got a different way to think about this, I think, then, hey, I'm 45 or I'm 35 or I'm 55 and I've got 10 or 20 or 30 years and this is what the projections are telling me because they're projecting it based on today's interest rates when we don't know what the interest rates are going to be. And basically, the lower the interest rate, the higher the lump sum is going to be. So we're in a pretty high-ish interest rate environment right now uh, relative to you know recent experience. So if you're seeing you know 1.1 million based on today's interest rates, and this may be a decision 10 years from now, you may have a totally different number based on you know what interest rates are going to be in the future, which you obviously don't know. The calculation from the pension, the payout, is usually pretty accurate because it's like literally like we're just going to assume this is your pay raise, you know, and here's what you're going to get. 
you know, your top three and multiply it out and it's just a big math problem. But the lump sum is really largely determined by interest rates. So that's going to be question number one. The other question that I have around the annuity payout is what is that income stream going to do over time? You know, so let's say that you're 60 years old today or 65 and you're like, I think I'm going to live 30 more years. At least that's what I got to plan, you know, which I would agree 30, 35 years. Is that $8,000 going to be flat for the next 30 years? Because that's the equivalent of losing well over half, even more than half of your purchasing power to inflation, even at regular inflation rates. You know, so we, we can look at price of milk, gas, groceries, cheese, travel, whatever, and see that over time, those prices increase. Today, you've got this $8,000 income, and maybe you don't need all 8000 bucks, But in the future, as prices rise, that $8,000 may get surpassed by the cost of living, and you've got a flat income stream that doesn't rise with inflation. So I'd be concerned about the inflation protection, if there is any, and maybe there is, because some pensions have that, depending on where your organization is structured, how it's structured. When you look at it purely on a math standpoint and you go, well, 8,000 a month is greater than 4,000 a month. So therefore the 8,000 a month is better. I think you're missing out on, you know, the realisticness of, is that a word? Realisticness? Real, realism? I don't know. Be realisticness. I think be, it's, I think I put be, be on the front of it. Right. Yes. Be realisticness. There it is. Of the trajectory of life. And I'm concerned that in my experience, you take the high income and you go, oh, I've got $100,000 a year to live on. and Life is good. And now, 10 years from now, it's like, I've got hundred grand to live on, and it's a little snug. And 20 years from now, it's like, I have hundred grand to live on, and that's not even close to enough. And 30 years from now, I need to start writing big checks for medical expenses or long-term care costs or something like that, and I don't have any extra because I've got this stream of income that's flat. Other considerations to think about are, what happens if you pass away? So you go to get your first check out of the mailbox and you get hit by the mail truck. You had this million dollar asset that's been converted into $8,000 income stream and you know, nobody cashes the first check, right? So you want to look and see what benefits are able to be transferred to your kid, you know, should you want to do that. And then the other piece of this is, and you kind of alluded to it, is the outside assets that are available b- besides this. So I think Ali said, hey, I've got a 403B, so I've got some money outside there too. If you've got pension and 403B and social security and you know an investment property and you've got all these different streams of income, I think that that's really what you're trying to solve for is can I create a stream of income over my lifetime that is going to allow me to live the life that I want to live? In that case, sometimes having that guaranteed pension money, a little bit of guaranteed social security money, and you can say, all right, I'm going to live on this for the next 10 years while my retirement account grows and that retirement account money is then used to offset the rising inflation costs in 15 years from now. So there's a lot of different ways to structure it. And this is where I think having, you know, a really well thought out retirement income plan is is super important. People who are really great savers, it's hard to kind of turn that around and go, well now how do I turn this all into a paycheck to me? Like I'm used to going to work and I get a paycheck and I save some and you know, all goes into this big bucket and I got all tons of money. But now how do I take all this all these different income streams and turn it into a paycheck back to me yeah. for the next 30 or 40 years. So there's a lot of things to think about here and um, l- largely starts with, is this just an exercise of thinking about it or is this a decision that you're making like now, you know, in the next two months or six months? Before they change the interest rate, which will be different. Well, the interest rates generally change at the beginning of the year and they generally know those changes. I think it's October, late October, early November. So if you're retiring next year, you're pretty much already locked into what those interest rate numbers are going to be. They're not going to change throughout the year, generally. I really like the point you made that if that $8,000 number doesn't go up, remember that you have to build in your own inflation rider, which means living on less than that and then banking some of the money for later. Or you know, realizing that you're going to slow down over time and, and you won't have as much to spend later on. Yeah, it's hard to predict that and it's certainly hard to account for it. If this were the only source of income, I would be very hesitant to devise a spending plan on all of the dollars. You know what I mean? And like not accounting for any sort of extra fluff in there. Sure sounds fun for a while though. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 8,000 bucks minus some taxes, you're probably living on 6,500 bucks or $7,000 a month. That's, you know, that's pretty sweet, especially if you don't have a lot of debt. 
but in reality, you probably need to be living on four ish thousand dollars a month so that you can save the three grand because in 20 years from now, you're going to need that extra money to pay for the, the rising costs. You just have to model this out and you'll see what the impact of it is over time. Ali, thanks for the question. And, uh, oh, gee, thanks for the fantastic answer. This is the, you know, Ali asked about annuities and then immediately went into pensions. And that's because at its heart, an annuity is a pension. And I think a lot of people, OG, don't know that. They're like, oh, I love a pension, but I hate annuities. At their base, they're the same damn thing. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Uh, if you've got a question for us, you can be just like Ali and Ali's now famous dog and uh, leave us a question. Stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail gets you there. A hey, time to transition into our last segment of this show. We call this the back porch where we hang out and we always start that off by talking about the community calendar and Doug, we've got some fun happening this week. Yeah, just so are you saying it's finally time we can go out in the back porch and have a cocktail, even though we just got That's, done well, toasting with well, coffee mugs? <laughs> apparently, OG is uh, already <laughs> three coffee mugs into his cocktail. Right. Who knew? So we're out there now. We're going to chill. I want to talk a little bit about Instagram Live because uh, that's always a ton of fun. We've got two Instagram Lives coming up this week. We've got one tomorrow. That's Tuesday at like, uh, what is it, like 1130 Eastern time? Yeah, 1130 Eastern time. And then again on Thursday at five o'clock Eastern time. You got to show up because you never know what's going to happen in our Instagram Lives. What I loved was last week, Kate had this great community moment where she asked people for ideas for frugal holiday parties and everybody who was on the Instagram live kind of contributed these really amazing ideas. And together they all came up with this great idea for a frugal holiday party. Yeah, it was fantastic. It was like, we didn't need a guest. The guest was you. Right. And just some of the ideas. I love the idea, by the way, that uh, somebody presented there, which came originally, I think from Keith Ferrazzi, at uh, Never Eat Alone in, in this uh, great book from, God, over a decade ago, probably now. Uh, <laughs> probably but, two decades, man. Yeah. But maybe two decades ago. Keith had this great thing that I implemented, Doug, which was go to the local high school or community college, find either somebody who plays a guitar very well, like go to the music people, the music department, and tell them what you want to do. And you can pay very little money because they just want to perform in front of people bring these kids in who are great musicians still undiscovered to play your gig. That's not the cool part. The cool part is don't tell anybody coming to the party that that's going to happen and have them show up maybe an hour, hour and a half after the party starts. So have, go ahead and have your, whatever the dinner's going to be or whatever you're going to do first. And then halfway through these kids come in, they set up in your living room and they start playing. And I agree with Keith. Every time that happens, it takes this, you know, okay neighborhood thing that's like, oh, yeah, we'll go over to Doug's house and hang out for a little bit. It turns it into the, one of these epic, epic get togethers. I thought that was a great one somebody shared. Yeah, great ideas. And it's what I love about our community. We have built such a strong community that you're right. Sometimes we don't even need a special guest. We just need to get all our community members together to share knowledge and, and share ideas. It, you know, over on the Facebook page in the basement, somebody found one of my signs that I posted in the Pacific Northwest that said, Beware of Doug. I post them all over the country. I just want people a little on edge. <laughs> Just a little on edge because they don't know what's coming out of Doug's mouth or what I'm going to do next. So I like it that way. So um, thanks. Uh, thanks for posting that sign that you, that you found. But we also have we also have some really good, insightful stuff out there, too. Alex Hoft, Hoft, Alex Hoft uh, posted a, a really deep question. What I like is he took a little swipe at OG, too, while, while he was at it. But he said, I just listened to SB 1439, which I think was our. We always love that. Yeah. Which was like what our, our tech episode, right? Our hot. What's hot? Yeah. What's Bridget Carey. Um, but he said, after hearing OG's familiar answer to the target date question, I was curious what everyone's thoughts were on the ideal timeline of converting to a more conservative portfolio. And he goes on, there's a little bit more to it, but I just love that people are out there in the basement asking serious questions and getting more input from other people who are really focused on their finances and their, and their retirement approach. So Alex, thanks for posting that. And, uh, and then, you know, we've got a review that I really liked. I want to go back and and read the one that talks about how I'm the savior of the show, but I can't do that every every week. Level two EV, still my favorite review of all time. But I also, <laughs> but I also liked uh, a review from Jen from Fort Worth, who said there's so much value in this podcast. It can help you grow your savings, reduce your spending, and all the while 
thinking about retirement before the official date, highly recommend five stars. So Jen from Fort Worth, thanks for that. Um, you know, and anybody wants to shoot right to the top of me uh, reading your review, just make sure you talk about my value and importance to the podcast. That's all it takes, OG. Darn sure I'm going to read that. Uh, if people pander. Stroke his ego a little bit. Isn't that what it takes for all of us? Look, I'm, I'm, I'm not even trying to hide it. I'm just putting it right out there. <laughs> uh, somebody, OG, has an important birthday coming up. Have you thought about what birthday gift you're giving yourself this year? <sighs> I haven't. No. No, this is kind of a run-of-the-mill one. But, um, but there's still time. I'm sure it'll... probably best gift is being with us. Um, okay. <laughs> I'll think about that one. Um, um maybe uh, put me down for, for sure. Maybe on that one. Well, while he thinks about that, let's, uh, stack our to-do list up. Uh, Doug, what should we have learned in this episode? Well, Joe, here's what should be on our to-do list today. First, take some advice from Chuck Wachendorfer. Chuck Wachendorfer. God, it just gets better every time. Pause this podcast right now and write down the type of leader you hope to be. Then list your first move, which should be to work on your leadership skills immediately. Second, are you on your way to buy some groceries for the holidays? Just breathe. Breathe in. Breathe out. Just breathe. And finally, what's on my to-do list? I got to call up all the members of my old band, the Whiskey Tango Debutantes. We're getting the band back together, baby. Thanks to Chuck for joining us today. You can find his book, Don't Wait for Someone to Fix It, wherever books are sold. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salci High. Our producer is Karen Refine. This show was written by Lisa Curry, who's also the host of the Long Story Long podcast, with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Wonder how beautiful we all are? Of course, you'll never know if you don't check out our YouTube version of this show, engineered by Tina Eichenberg. Then you'll see once and for all that I'm the best thing going for this podcast. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Youngkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. Say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show.